Good evening, and welcome to our Women in Energy uh, event today, where we're celebrating young people who are groundbreaking in the energy industry in our Southern African country. I welcome you on behalf of ULP and all the members. I will be shortly handing over to us Priscilla to do the actual welcome. But thank you for joining us. We are continuing to observe the non-pharmaceutical protocols uh, that are given by the government, and we urge you to continue to do that. We're also urging our ULP community to continue to help the adult, elderly to register and to go get the vaccines in the different parts of the country. As we're about to start, I just want to make a few announcements. We'll go through those announcements, and then I'll hand over to us Priscilla to do the formal introduction, and then we'll move on to Ntato, who will then be facilitating today's event. The first advert, uh, probably the book launch. So we've got a book website that you can see there. So if you go to our Unleashing Leadership Potential, the CO.za, you can get different books from our previous speakers, from our ULP Authors Forum, and the next advert should be on those who want to sell their books on the platform. As part of the ULP Authors Forum, we urge you to continue to, to submit your books. And introducing our speakers, and hopefully we'll have our Priscilla at the end. In the energy sector, at a time where COVID has actually decimated opportunities for everybody, uh, specifically black people, women, and young people. I think the recent labor force survey results around youth unemployment and the youth unemployment rate demonstrate that it's a dire situation for young people in South Africa. However, despite these odds, this is an opportunity to pivot. This is an opportunity to understand where to seek um, a way of being, of finding a way through the pathway of this difficulty. And we've got a panel today of young people who are groundbreaking in the energy sector. Um, we've got um, Mitam Ntari, who is one of the founders of Masako Apasa, as well as the founder of BEPA, uh, the Black Energy Professionals Association. We have Bitumelo Sesake, who is a, um, who, who is an engineer, who is a wells engineer but who also has her own um, organization and her own company. And then we've got uh, Matthew Mflatelwa, who's at the helm of the strategic thinking at Africa's biggest electricity utility, which is ESCOM. And he has the daunting task of re revising and pivoting ESCOM into uh, decarbonization and a new energy future. So the way we're gonna run today is we're going to give each panelist an opportunity to share their thoughts about the opportunities and challenges that they experience, and just some of the pearls and some of their reflections on how they, are, how they have managed to position themselves in a context of, 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 of complexity, of volatility, of uncertainty. We're, we're in a VUCA world. And in that context, how have they managed to reposition themselves? How have they managed to find opportunities for themselves? What has it meant for themselves as a professional? as a business owner, as somebody who works in a company. Um, we, we have had, a pre we had an additional speaker who couldn't be here today purely because of COVID. And that's just the level of disruption that we're all facing now. So each speaker will get 15 minutes to give their inputs. 
and then I'll pose a couple of questions to them. We'll move on to the next speaker. And then at the end of the session, we will go to the people on the line and, and get some of your Q&A to pose to the specific, uh, to any of the specific panelists or to, or to you know, generally to the panel. Um, after that, we will close with some thoughts from Priscilla Abelani, as well as our patron, Mr. Maurice Khadebe, and hopefully that will take us to half past eight. On that basis, I'm going to hand over to Mita, who is, um, as, as indicated before, one of the groundbreakers in business, one of the groundbreakers in finance, one of the groundbreakers in consultancy, one of the groundbreakers in professional organization and voluntary work, just a general all-rounder in the energy sector. If I can hand over to you for your thoughts. Thank you very much, Ntato, <laughs> and thank you very much to the ULP for having me. Uh, as I was introduced, my name is Midam Klari Bon Mabonya. I hail from the beautiful province of Limpopo. I'm the youngest of four children of uh, Madumi and Matlaku Mabonya, who died very young. But then one of the key things that they left with us, they taught us the power of entrepreneurship, activism, and believing in yourself. And I was, uh, I was raised in a beautiful town of Mangueng, where Peter, the late Peter Mugaba is from, and it's where the University of Limbobo is all uh, from. So we experience the challenges of youth. But then one of the key things that I learned as a youngster is seeing uh, young people taking on the challenges uh, and, and, and putting the power in their hands. And I mean, at the young age, tender age of nine years, I was one of the pioneers of Peter Mugaba. We used to match the streets we used to put, you know, we used to be put with tear gases and everything else at the time where it was challenging and apartheid, whereby women were not looked upon as equals. And one of the greatest things that I would give to my father was I grew up in a household whereby my father put my mother at the, at the forefront. My mother was like a CEO of their businesses. And uh, she was the one who made most of the decisions in our homes. Uh, and from that tender age, I learned that, you know, it, they, they, women can come back home at late at night. There was no working hours. My mom would rock up. I mean, my mom did ne never cooked for us. So I learned at that tender age that women are not for the kitchen. And one of the key things also is I, I also married a very supportive husband uh, through Sikmim Klari who actually, and I will not say he allows me because I have the independence of being, but then he actually is a pillar of my strength. He encourages me. Uh, he, 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 he actually uh, lets, uh, my, because I've got a young daughter who's growing up now seeing a woman being the power and the strength in a home. And one of the key things that I've also learned was education is extremely, extremely important. And even this through COVID, and even when you're talking about the states of youth unemployment, when we drill down in terms of who is unemployed, it's generally the ones with who lack education. I mean, in my life, I will say, even the connections or the networks and the relationships that I have. A lot of people look at going to university as just getting a degree. Most of my networks that I keep today are all those people that I actually uh, met in varsity. And I mean, as uh, Nelson Mandela always said, is that uh, education is the greatest equalizer wherever you're from. My, my husband's father, uh, my husband's uh, wife, uh, I mean, sorry, uh, mother was actually a cleaner and she actually and he actually because he became a CA he now grew up to run his own successful uh, business uh, and I started my beginnings uh, at Deloitte and I moved to Investec which are both in the financial services industry but then one of the key things that happened to me when I was at Deloitte is that I was a young woman, but then mentorship is also very important. I was mentored by the current uh, Loisi Bam, who's the current uh, CEO of Deloitte. Uh, one of the things that he learned, uh, taught me was to be an activist, to fight for my rights, even a rating. When somebody gave you a rating in your work and I did not agree with it, I challenged it and I, uh, to an extent whereby I ended up being promoted exceeding expectation. So it was from that we overcome uh, all the things that we do. And from that, I learned also from my parents the power of activism. My father was the founder of the National African Farmers Union. 
at the time. So it was with that and the great spirit that we also got to actually in our lives to say, as you grow and as you, uh, you are moving somewhere, you must just not be alone in your journey. What are we doing in our lives to empower people? And it, uh, through that, me and my sister and other colleagues, we went to form the Black Energy Professional Association, which seeks to actually uh, influence policy and represent the unheard voice of black people. As we see, we've been, uh, uh, the, there's talks of 230 billion rand that has been spent in the renewable energy industry. But then I don't know a billionaire in my forte. You ask yourself, where did all those uh, uh, billions uh, go to? I mean, we started, me and my sister, an infrastructure business. Uh, uh, I mean, most women, it's, 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 it's unheard of. It's a very difficult space. We started in the energy space, uh, uh, and uh, at the time, there was the renewable energy sector. I remember I would, when the renewable round one uh, was starting, at the end, uh, we, we, were, we had partners with an American company called AES. They decided to disinvest out of emerging markets right two weeks before the bids were supposed to come out. We uh, approached uh, DBSA and the IDC at the time to say, can we have a black IPP without the international people? And then they told us, you know, I will never forget, you know, this word is always a sore word, who is your uh, strategic equity partner? We said, I mean, really, you can be my strategic equity partner. We have a fully wrapped up EPC. We have an, a, a, a knowledgeable O&M. What else do we need? And uh, to cut the long story short, I mean, we ended up having to sell our project to uh, another international IPP. And even till to date, you do not have any women-owned IPPs. So, and with that, we are actually wanting to break the myth. We actually want to be the first, and uh, the, we're going to uh, not only black women, but then internationally to groundbreak in the hydrogen economy. I mean, as youth and young people are talking about what are all the things that are talking about. My one cousin the other day was saying, people are saying there's no job. And he said, hey, Yena is reading every day, people are creating apps. Why are young people not creating apps? And we are reading every day. People are talking about this hydrogen economy as the future. Where are we as young black people in skills development, in everything else? So we are actually pivoting. We are making sure that we are actually going to be the South African flagship hydrogen project that we are developing in Prisca. And that project is going to actually, uh, actually give a path of a way in terms of commercialization of the hydrogen economy in South Africa, which can also be able to add, assist and be able to be an answer to the demand response of ESCOM challenges as we also see uh, uh, today. And as a company, we hire young people. I was saying nowadays, I, I poke people a lot on LinkedIn. And one of the things that, uh, the key things that I look at, you must be under 30. Uh, <laughs> and when they say youth people, because I'm saying uh, we, uh, we need to be developing uh, uh, jobs for the youth. And one of the key things that we did through COVID, we announced a 1.75 billion rand energy fund. And in that particular fund, we're going to see how do we empower other women? How do we empower youth? How do we make sure that black people are manufacturing? They're involved in the entire value chain. And our, uh, our, our, uh, our energy fund it does not only focus on renewable energy, we actually focus on the entire value chain. Obviously, unfortunately, because we now need to make sure that we are moving to net zero, we can't invest in... Uh, coal and in, in oil. And as part of the Matlaco vision, in terms of what we do, we t actually the work that we do is all based on social infrastructure. We also now managing uh, one of the flagship uh, uh, project in South Africa. It, it is, has been gazetted, it's SIP 28. And with the SIP 28, what it manages to do, it is a renewable energy program and resource efficiency of all 92,000 buildings of government. And in that project, we seek to develop and skill 117,000 youth and employ 145,000 uh, uh, people in the next uh, 20 years. So in all we do, we make sure we touch other people's lives. We make sure that uh, we are involving uh, people uh, in our lives. And through COVID, we made sure that we know uh, I mean, I did not, I had never heard of SharePoint 
or teams or any of those things until uh, uh, this time. But then, you know, we all, agility is very important. We all came together. Everybody had to be working from work. Everybody, I mean, our, our key IT guy in our office is actually one of the analysts. He's not an IT expert, nothing at all. But then he overnight became our IT to go to person. And one of the things I would like to give to the youth, you know, in life, you can't be a one-trick pony. You have to be a triple threat. You always <laughs> have to find all of those things that you know, because, you know, you never know where life is going to put you. Even us as, as Mataku, we had to adapt in terms of diversification. You cannot only uh, 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 depend on one source of revenue. You have to find those uh, uh, annuity revenues, all of those things that uh, can actually uh, help you in times of trouble. And in all that we do, you must always ask yourself, and that's what COVID ha has helped us uh, learn, uh, this product in COVID, will it be needed? Even in a, in a pandemic, do I continue to be relevant in a pandemic? And if the answer is yes, uh, then go for that. Obviously, there are those nice things to have. We always like our holidays. I mean, if there's no holiday, I mean, how do we distress? But then planning for the long term, reaching out. I'm loving, you know, this app, LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. You know, there is a, a way you put ready to work, open to work. I've been looking for those young people, and I will encourage a lot of this, uh, our, our young people to poke uh, the likes of the Priscilla's uh, on LinkedIn. Don't be scared that someone is top, top CEO of something. You never know. I mean, in this COVID, I was called by really top guys for meetings, and these people met, met me on LinkedIn. So, I mean, uh, so let's use technology. Let's make sure that we are moving with the times. Let's make sure that we stay relevant, uh, even when I know it is hard for us. But then education, online courses, I mean, through COVID, we am a Stanford graduate now, mm -hmm. Stanford University gra graduate. And we actually did the Stanford Transformation Seed uh, course in the middle of COVID. And I will end there because learning never ends. Mm. No, thank you uh, for that, Mita. I was actually going to ask some questions and then I realized, no, <laughs> there's nothing to ask because there's so much uh, richness in what you're speaking about. I mean, you, you span all the way from choose the right husband <laughs> <laughs> to, you know, be an activist, make yourself visible, be unapologetic about who you are and don't be shy. I mean, the point you make about be a triple threat and not a one trick pony is so important because we come from an, an era where our parents wanted us to be one thing, you know, a doctor, an engineer, an accountant. And you're somebody who's come from accounting, and now you're a, pretty much a jack of all trades in the energy sector. I'm developing a hydrogen <laughs> project. Yes. And I'm advising on renewable energy and resource efficiency of the country. And, and in all that we do, we are very good. And one of the things that I learned is agility. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, you know, be, to be able to adapt. And, but then in all that we do, you must be excellent. And a sense of entrepreneurship. And people think that to be an entrepreneur, you have to start your own business. No, 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 no. In all the work that you're doing, it's, this, it's the same as a young person, and I know it's hard, when you don't have a job, this is entrepreneurship, calling on... Uh, eh, 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 and saying that I see you're doing a wonderful job. All I want to do is to come and shadow you. And I know we are in the land of COVID where I cannot come physically to work. Um, if you can actually just help me with data that I shadow you every day in all your meetings, I can be your scribe, I can be whatever. It's just simple things like that. And, and, and you don't have to pay me to start. All you need to do now, because it's no longer money for transport, now it's money for data. Uh, uh, <laughs> so, and, and I will be there. And people appreciate that. And that's one of the things that I will just give to the youth. Just uh, be bold. And don't be scared of all these people that are out there. And research. You know, I found myself in the middle of COVID knowing all the grants that are available out there. I had never thought that, I mean, for a year, our business, we were not paid. We continued doing work, but we were not paid. Found out that there were CIFA grants 
There's so many grants in South Africa that I, 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 even I now started, you, I, 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 I sent them to my tailor, my gardener, my, uh, my plumber, everybody to say, you know, all these grants and can I help you apply? And we must always ask ourselves, how am I connected and pitching mm. in into the economy in or, or everything that is happening? No, oh, thank you, Mita. I mean, this is the information age. We have no excuse not to really leverage the fact that we've got information at our fingertips. And one of the points you're making here now as well is be willing to do the heavy lifting. You know, sometimes we're not going to get remunerated for it. You're not going to get paid for it. But it might give you visibility. It might give you a, a seat at the table. It might give you a foot in the door. And we need to be doing to, to do whatever we need to do to, to, walk, to walk in the direction where we want to go and to gain the visibility that we want to gain. If, if someone like Mita can do voluntary work, because that's what it's called if you weren't being paid for a year. If someone <laughs> like Mita can do voluntary work for a year, almost a year. Yes, yeah? and, and I mean, <laughs> the work that we do for the Black Energy Professional Association is voluntary work. Yeah. Uh, we don't get paid for that. I mean, well, now we are, we thank God, uh, finally we got DBSA as, uh, as, uh, as our sponsor because they like the work that we are doing. Uh, but then for two years, Matako uh, seeded and we employed people uh, as uh, the Black Energy Professional Association because we saw if I am not doing for myself, if I'm going to wait for someone else to write a policy and by the time the policy is written, you want now to now do it and say the policy doesn't suit me. You have to be having a seat on the table. Actives of it, like, you know, Youth Month, when you see those young people, June 16, what they were doing, they were fighting for their rights. Where are we today? Where is the youth of today? We no longer maybe in the land of uh, COVID, never have to maybe march or do it, do it. But then there's so many ways in the technology ways that we are empowered to be activists in everything that we do. Thank you, Mita. We're now going to come to Bitumelo. Bitumelo, you, you fascinate me because you're, you're a wells engineer. I think the other day you told me there's a longer <laughs> definition of what you actually do. But in my mind... I've got, you know, deep, deep horizon and I've got the guys on the rig in, in the safety gear and the, and the big safety boots and the hats and the, and the goggles and, and they're the ones making sure that, you know, the well is perfectly positioned and going in and then doesn't cause a, a blowout. Yeah, yeah, you got the terminology right there. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, when you, you, I look at you, Bidu Melo, but you're actually working in one of the most exciting acreages in the world at the moment in Mozambique. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we would love to hear your, your input for the day. Ah, thank you so much, uh, and Kato. And I'd like to just welcome, just to thank the leadership of ULP for the invitation. I'm honored to share the stage with, with you all, uh, such a privilege. So uh, back to, to what you were saying, uh, and Tato. you know, I, I stumbled over the oil and gas industry. I didn't know it existed. So my, my story is it's, it's really unique, and it's not something that one would wake up and actually imagine. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I really remember, um, you know, when I was in university, so I actually studied geology, mining geology. So I, I did my uh, BSc in geology all the way through to honors, but I never practiced as a geologist, uh, purely because I did a vacation work in my first year at Lonman Platinum Mine in Marigana. This was before Marigana became the Marigana we know today. Um, but then quickly I, I realized that this is not what I want to do. I could not relate to, to, to uh, mining on my day-to-day -day basis, you know. Uh, but just like any other family, in this it's like a household, you finish what you start. You don't give up. It doesn't matter how long it takes you. Because it was hard. <laughs> it was really hard. It doesn't matter how long it takes you. It doesn't matter how much it's going to cost. We will finish what we start. Resilience. So that's where it started. And I liked what you said, uh, Meta, you know, about your father, uh, how, you know, he instilled so much of uh, you being a go-getter and, saying that it doesn't matter what industry it is. As a woman, I'm not, you know, desire, but by design, I'm not forced to be in the kitchen. You know, so for me as well, my father has been, you know, he played such a pivotal role in saying, tigers don't cry. That's what we go in at our house. Whatever happens, like, tigers don't cry. You'll be, you'll survive, just hanging there. So fast forward um, towards the final year of my uh, qualification, my, my um, degree, we had one of the oil and gas service companies coming in at university during the recruitment drive. And this uh, company was called, uh, and it's still called Baker Hughes. So it's an oil and gas service company. So what they do, they provide drilling equipment services, um, logging services to the likes of Shell, Total, Sasol, Petra SA, just to name a few. 
So I was fortunate enough um, to get exposed and introduced to the oil and gas industry at that time. So for the first time, a young girl from Haramguwa, who hasn't traveled anywhere outside of Gauteng, um, except to Limpopo. <laughs> So now I'm being told that, no, you will need to now move and up to Cape Town, you know, to the coast. I'm like, ooh, that's nice. And then obviously then start traveling the world and learning about the oil and gas industry. And what really came to me as well was that I learned a lot of terminologies that I never knew existed. You know, that's when I started learning about onshore and offshore. You know, so I haven't been to the coast. I don't even know what shore lines are. So that for me was a great exposure. So exposure is very important. And as in when we look at our youth today, we ask ourselves, what exposure are they getting? And I like the, um, the environment now that is more digital. We are able to bring in um, you know, webinars on career days. You know, I work a lot with a lot of um, NGOs around career days. Some of them are very uh, dear friends of mine and colleagues, where we, we, we connect with the um, students from Limpopo, you know, from um, Fosslerers, just to give them that um, introduction into, into the energy space. So predominantly for me, my, my why and my main date as um, Fosslerer Energy Solutions is to bring energy education and energy awareness. Because I realize that that is what we are lacking as South Africans. That's what we are lacking in terms of having that awareness of how the energy sector is set up. So I joined Baker Hughes, I moved to the coast. And that was my first opportunity, my first step into the oil and gas industry. So now that I have my foot in the door, um, I had to really do a lot of work. And the second opportunity came up, I think two months within starting for uh, working, is that I, I was um, offered a opportunity to take on an international assignment program in, in, in the US, in the United States, in a small town called Bakersfield. So this town, Everywhere you look, it's pump jacks, you know, it's, a, it's an oil-rich town. And it's onshore, so now I knew where I was going. And <laughs> with our industry, what's important to note is that uh, onshore operations are deemed uh, a little bit less riskier compared to offshore. So they are able to then go in and take graduates to train them and, and to give them that exposure without putting uh, themselves under a higher risk, you know. So I spent good two years really learning and, and trying to get as much as I can. One would think two years is a lot, but it's not if you have never even heard about an oil rig until you know, about a few months ago. So I, I really leveraged on that opportunity. Um, I didn't have family in the United States, no friends, I didn't know anybody. So you can imagine uh, starting off, it was just me, myself, and I. So at that point, I needed to be the CEO of me incorporated. You know, it was just me. I, I depended on myself. Um, so, you know, I, I did that. I spent that much time. So those were the opportunities that I really, really hold very dear to my heart. The challenges that I faced in my career happened when I came back to South Africa. Yo, 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 yo. Um, I remember I came back around 2014, 2015. At the time, the price of Brent crude was at about, what, $25? a barrel, when I started, we were sitting comfortably there at about $120 a barrel, so you can imagine. So this meant that um, for the company I worked for, we were recruited to work on a project for Petro SA. So that project stopped. That meant they don't need us. The company doesn't need us, and I was retrenched. So that for me, it, you know, sometimes I saw it coming, as and when I looked in, at, at the price of Brent crude oil to see, you know, um, there's a bit of a, of a shakiness in the industry. Absolutely, there's no way, um, you know, economically and financially, uh, such operations will be kept going and they will be paying us if, you know, the price is sitting at $25 a barrel. So I, I had to then pack my bags, come back home, save money, you know, the little money I made in the States, save that, come back home. Uh, great family, my parents really, you know, they helped me out to say if you're in need, come on ask us for help, but I was like, no, 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 no. I spent two years in the United States all by myself. I survived, I don't need your help, <laughs> you know. But then um, I, I had to really look at what, what's next, right? So in, in, in my journey, coming back, I had to quickly change from being a geologist and make that, um, you know, in, in the education space so that I can now move into engineering because that was more recognized in the oil and gas space. So I went and I used my time very wisely. Like you said, Meta, education is very important. So the money that I saved, I invested in myself. I went to VITS. I studied a Master of Science in Engineering, specializing in oil and gas engineering, uh, also known as petroleum engineering. 
a great course. Um, so those of you who are trying to get into the space, check it out. So I, I did that and I spent a good year doing that, pivoting, changing myself from a Bachelor of Science in Geology to a Master of Science in Engineering in uh, Petroleum. So that came to a great opportunity because that's where I started uh, looking at uh, companies that I work for. And I applied for one of the positions. It was a senior position. I was so eager, right? I created my own, <laughs> I created my own opportunity. Because for me, I said, you know what? Um, this is the first time in South Africa on LinkedIn, I'm seeing a position that's been advertised that's under oil and gas. They were looking for a senior completions engineer. And for me, I said, you know what? A lot of the specs that they have t t tabled up, I've done this work before. Yes, maybe on the business side, I haven't really had an opportunity to experience, but what could go wrong? If anything, they will know that a person like me, a young black female, exists in South Africa with the oil and gas skills that I've, I've really heard a lot of the time as and when we engage in webinars and conferences where a lot of the leadership and decision makers, they will, um, most of the, they will normally say that we don't have skills in South Africa. And it, it baffles me a lot because then I start looking around, I look at my, my peers, I look at my uh, colleagues, uh, very well educated, they have international degrees, by the way, from very well known institutions, and, but yet uh, our decision makers are, are saying there is no skills. And then that, that's where the question came in, but where are you looking, you know? So for me then, as in when I started working, um, working in the fields in, in Mozambique, I've learned a lot. And a lot of my learning came from my, my supervisors who, you know, they insist I'm not your supervisor, I'm your mentor. And they really took the time to train me because they understand that the, the, the dynamics right now are different from when they started off. I don't have the opportunity to travel around the world like they did before when they started off, right? So I've learned a lot and I continue learning a lot in, in, in the space. And um, to bring forward as well in terms of networking and uh, sharing your knowledge, I in, it made sure that I joined some of these associations. So I'm part of the Society of Petroleum Engineers, of which I'm a volunteer. I've been volunteering for the past eight years. <laughs> Where we also, you know, bring this awareness about oil and gas, and then we bring technical talks. We we train our our students and also even our young professionals, you know. So I, I make sure that I continue doing that as well. And I'm part of the Southern Africa section where we try to engage with our other industry associations such as EXA. So because now I am in engineering, right? With EXA, I cannot register as a professional. Um, <coughs> You know, I can't get a PR range because they don't recognize uh, petroleum engineering. So now this is the struggle that we all are facing as and when we come back to, to, to South Africa to say we need to be recognized. As and when we're trying to, to look for jobs, they ask you, do you have a PR range? <laughs> you know, and then that's one of the stumbling blocks that a lot of my peers be facing. And we're trying to work um, hand in hand with uh, the Society of Petroleum Engineers in Southern Africa section to say, let us find a way to um, have petroleum uh, uh, engineering as part of, of EXA, you know, to be recognized. So those are some of the challenges that I had, I had to overcome. And I would like to say to, you know, to the youth of South Africa, when it comes to the energy space, Knowledge is very important. Education, you never stop learning. You heard Meta was talking about hydrogen. <laughs> you know, 10 years, well, five years ago, that was not even spoken of. You know, but now everywhere you go, you turn it on the TV, you go to a webinar, you open an email, hydrogen this, hydrogen that. You know, so it's very important to surround yourself with uh, like-minded people, do your research, um, reach out to people like myself, like Meta, and also, you know, try not to be narrow-minded and as and when opportunities come, grab them, because sometimes opportunities don't come in the way you have envisioned them. They come disguised. I wouldn't have known that uh, you know, taking this opportunity that I did uh, 10 years ago will lead me to where I am today. You know, so leveraging that, make sure that at the end of the day, you have yourself uh, to, to, to be accountable for. Um, be the CEO of Me Incorporated, you know, run your own company as an individual. Don't depend on the organizations that you work for. They are not who you are, you know, and I had to learn that very quick when I got retrained that associating myself with companies that I work for, when, when they let you go, 
it's painful, you know. So sometimes try and remind yourself that you are your own individual and this is your journey and know your why. So I'm very um, happy to, you are your own individual and this is your journey and know your why. So I'm very um, happy to, to contribute a lot into um, looking for uh, energy around the world and providing the African continent with uh, the energy that they need. So what I would like to say to the leadership, uh, to the decision makers in closing is that we are here. The young South Africans with skills in oil and gas, we are here, we exist. Um, I don't know where you have been looking, but I opened the door to please engage me because I, I, I can direct you, you know, I can provide that guidance where needed. So uh, in close, I'll just leave that uh, at that point. Thank you so much. Thank, thanks, Bridu Melo. I think I, I took a number of take-homes from you. One of them is actually having a teachable spirit and being willing to go out of your comfort zone. I mean, you come all the way from Karanku, <laughs> inland, <laughs> <laughs> to offshore. <laughs> you know, you know, there's still people who don't eat fish. If they come from inland, they don't do coastal things, yeah. you know, other than to take that water in a bottle with a bit of sand in it. So, I mean, being willing to step out of your comfort zone and really just navigate and access all the opportunities open to you and, and be open-minded to, yeah. to where it could lead you. This, this notion of being a CEO of Me Incorporated, I think that's a very powerful statement. Uh, especially in a time when it's so easy to have a victim mentality. You know, this, this isn't happening for me. This person's not doing this for me. You, you come from retrenchment. You're sitting here and you're someone who's been retrenched. Yeah. Right? But for some people, retrenchment is the end of their lives yeah. because it means the organization can no longer have you and there is no vision or thinking beyond being had by an organization. <laughs> it's almost like a bad marriage, you know, being married, <laughs> you know, being wifed. <laughs> Changing your surname. <laughs> but um, the, the point is that you, you pivoted. You went from retrenchment. You thought, okay, how do I reposition myself? I'm watching the relationship between Forks and the cost of oil and what this means for the current qualifications I have now. And I'm looking at where the opportunities in the horizon is. And you move from being a geologist into a petroleum engineer. And that's a powerful thing because it means you took what you had and invested it in yourself. You're, you were your first investor yeah. in CEO of Me Incorporated. Yes. <laughs> so um, I think that's a, such a powerful take home for, for us. Um, I, did want, I do want you to reflect a bit on the point you're making around voluntary work, because it's come up through META as well, that there's something to be said about activism and volunteerism, okay. because you're speaking about professional registration. So what is, it, what is it that has made you step beyond yourself? Because you're talking about a battle that's bigger than you. Yeah. It's about making sure international petroleum engineers can be professionally recognized in South Africa. But why would you, why would you take on that cause instead of just remain narrow narrowly focused on your own career? Yeah, because the energy space is a global space. And if we, act, we think small, we will not make any change. So if one looks at things in a bigger scale, somebody will hear you. Because I, I, I've realized that someone is always watching. So if you're making the right noise at the right levels, change will come from up there. And like if I'm trying to make noise down here, and I don't affect the change that's required. No. Thanks, thanks, Peter Melo. I'm going to come now to Matthew. Um, Matthew, you're the gentleman on this panel. <laughs> you're not yes. the representative gentleman. <laughs> I, I, I am the <laughs> gentleman. Dr. Maurice, we have our representative gentleman. But um, I think what fascinates me about your journey, Matthew, is um, that you're really at the engine and the heart of probably one of the biggest organizational and institutional pivots in Africa at the moment in the energy sector. And that's head of strategy and planning at ESCOM. <laughs> so I think uh, we're all, I, I would love to hear your, your reflections and your input in that regard. Thanks, thanks Ntato. And firstly, thanks for the opportunity to speak among such esteemed people. I think after listening to these stories, it's so difficult for me to follow up and say, you know, what do I bring to the table? But I think after that introduction, you always find a way to scare me away from the task that's ahead. 
Um, but what you'll soon learn about me as I tell my story is that I'm a person that likes to challenge the status quo. You know, I like to say, why not? You know, and that goes hand in hand with my curious nature. I, I always like to pick things and understand what makes things work and why is it things that things are a certain way? Why can't they be a different way? So, I mean, it's a mammoth task. It is a huge task, but it can be done. That's honestly what I believe. And perhaps let me just give some, some reflections about my journey. And I think there's a lot of similarities that I can draw from, from my, my, my panel uh, peers here. So my, my journey, and, and mine is, I mean, the story I will tell is not unique to the energy sector. I think the concepts can be applicable to any context. So the big things for me were, I think, three things. One is resilience and growing a thick skin and, and recovering from your failures. Two is self-awareness, uh, understanding yourself, being able to reflect and being able to, you know, learn from your mistakes. And then the third one is having a sense of purpose. I think for me, if you have a clear sense of purpose, um, I think uh, a famous gentleman, I think it's, uh, I can't remember the name now, the Amazon uh, CEO, um, says they are stubborn with the vision and flexible on the detail. And I think if you have a purpose, you can always find a way to navigate and find different routes to the end goal that you want to achieve. So I've learned to say to myself, why do I exist? What do I want to achieve? And how I get there is just the vehicle that I use. Today it might be a taxi, tomorrow it's a car, the next day I might be walking. But the purpose is ultimately the same. So that's how I see things. But back to my history and how it shaped how I am today. I think the first milestone or less lesson that I learned was failure. And, and this came after, I come from a very modest uh, background, Soweto born, typical uh, boy from the township, very limited role models. Um, I think if I'm not mistaken, I was one of the first people to graduate from university in my entire street, in my family. So I come from an environment that said it's not possible. That's the first thing. But then secondly, I had an opportunity being raised by parents that didn't have the opportunity to go to university and, and work. Well, my mom managed to get a, a, a college qualification as a teacher, but my dad didn't finish matric. However, they managed to expose me to a, what we call now a multiracial education. And that was one of my biggest challenges in life. I, I came from a school in, in Soweto where we did not speak English, and I was expected to adapt, and, and you know, my medium of instruction was in English. And consequently, I failed my first year, which was standard one at the time. And it's a very important year in primary school because that's the transition between lower primary and senior primary. So on the first day of the next year after you fail, that's when they separate you. you know. And, and that lesson for me was like, that will never happen again. And as a result, I mean, since then, I, I was on the what they call the honors role and academic role because I, I told myself this will not happen again. I know I'm capable. Fast forward, um, I think, again, with, with sometimes, I think one of the warnings I'd like to maybe share is sometimes when we have a gift or a, an ability, there's a tendency to become complacent. And that for me crept in again. I think high school was a breeze. I was one of those students that also didn't study throughout through metric. And I was fortunate because I had figured out the system. But where I think I learned another lesson was in university. And uh, if I may add, at the time I was better looking than I am. So I had my fair share of challenges that distracted me from what I needed to be doing in university. Um, but the big thing, again, big lesson, um, I, I got to a point where I think I got disillusioned and I was, I would say arrogant, so arrogant that I thought I could do anything and I didn't need education. 
So I left university. I had registered as an engineer at the time, left university and decided I'm going to try out being, you know, on my own. And at the time when, when I was trying that, one of the most popular occupations for people my age was a call center agent. And that's when I thought I'd keep myself, you know, liquid uh, while I explore other opportunities. But again, for me, that was one of the most frustrating experiences because what was expected for, from me at the time was to read a script, not to apply my thinking, and to almost execute on something that I felt was morally wrong. You know, I worked for a bank, and at the time there was no credit control regulation, and we issued credit cards to people that were unemployed, uneducated, and these people were told, it's free money. You know, you, an old lady's calling you from a public phone. She's saying, I don't understand. I owe money, 50,000 rand limit. She's blown it. And her interest rate is sitting at 25, 30%. And I'm like, what is the system doing? I cannot continue to contribute to such a system. So, I mean, that frustration led me back to school. Again, that was not an easy journey. I, I had to beg to be accepted back into university. I think that was a very big lesson for me that, you know, once you get an opportunity, I, you shouldn't take your opportunities for granted. But the fact that I had left school and gone through the call center does not mean I cannot rise again. And I think I leveraged my experience from my failures before and said I can do it and I can rise again. And again, true to nature, history repeats itself, went back to university. And if I can throw in a brag again, I did quite well at university. And I think after university, and again, coming from a modest family, and this is to explain perhaps why I'm in government and, and specifically ESCOM, I think ESCOM came at a time when I really needed them. Um, I've, since high school, was a product of, of the state. I, I went through my first couple of years through NEFSAS, and then ESCOM came to the rescue. And as a result, I managed to get a qualification as a graduate. So, I mean, given that experience and those opportunities that were given to me, I was like, surely I need to contribute and give back to society the opportunities that were given to me. And I see myself as privileged. And I, my view is it is my responsibility to ensure that others can also benefit from the privilege that I, I have now. You know, Because if a young boy from Soweto like myself can graduate with an engineering degree from the state's uh, support, surely I should also find a way to contribute. And my contribution was to say, how do I benefit or how do I contribute to making the state better and therefore spread the resources? So I started at ESCOM and again, uh, another surprise in life. Um, I think we always dream when I started my engineering degree, I thought I would you know, uh, be a design engineer that sits in an office that comes up with these very clever answers to big problems. And unfortunately, uh, maybe to your point, Boitumelo, uh, that sometimes we need to be open-minded about what's in front of us and not expect opportunities to come in the shape and form that we expect them. So I spent a couple of years at the power station, the most difficult experience and grueling experience that I've, I've come across. Some of the things perhaps worth mentioning, being young, black, um, you, you are going into an environment where you are expected to provide leadership and direction from an engineering perspective to old white Afrikaans men. And I think those dynamics present a number of challenges for, for, for uh, presented a number of challenges for me at least. And that's when I learned how to navigate those kind of spaces because I think what I learned the most there is being able to lead people without using authority and, and learning different techniques of, of leadership, you know. And you also learn to be resilient, and that's the point about resilience. And, and people will, will always, I mean, the, the, the road to success is riddled with obstacles and, and, and potholes. And if you are going to be discouraged and despondent because of the challenges that you face, I think it's, it's going to be a difficult journey. But what's important to remember is why you are doing something. You know, I've always maintained to myself that, look, this person is being difficult with me, but I'm here for something more important than them. So 
I will continue. I was persistent. And quickly I realized that, no man, this work I'm doing here is not enough. You know, I wanted, I've always wanted to make a difference and I've always thought of myself making a big difference. And I was frustrated with the role I was playing at the power station, thinking to myself, surely there's more to this life thing and engineering thing than just being a power station system engineer. Um, and, and I wanted to make significant change. So there's a couple of opportunities, maybe to just fast forward the story. Um, I, I got an opportunity to work in head office on a number of strategic projects, which was, I think, one of the best experiences of my life. And again, another point from you, Boy Dumelo. I've treated, I've always treated every opportunity since I think my failures, like an interview. You know, you, you, you never know who's watching, you never know who's, who's looking. And I always try and give everything I do my all. So I, I didn't expect to be where I am today. Um, I think I've been in this role that, that, that Ntato described as head of strategy and planning. Uh, for the last nine months. I'm the youngest person that sits on ESCOM's executive committee, and I don't take that role and job lightly. I take it with all the seriousness that it comes with. Um, and and what, I mean, what I'm, I'm quite determined in my mind to make sure that I continue to, to contribute to society and I continue to give back, you know. And I'm, what I do is a means to an end, it's not the end itself. You know, my view is if I can ensure that ESCOM is profitable, sustainable into the future, it continues to provide the services that it needs to provide to South Africa and its people. And it's not the job itself that I'm after. So tomorrow I might be doing something else, but the purpose and the outcome for me is still what is core to, to what I do. So, yeah, that's in a nutshell, I mean, what, what, what I've learned and perhaps some of the external things that people can look at, which I think are very useful to navigating some of these complex environments and, and, and both Mita and Widumela touched on them. Mentorship, very key. Informal and formal networks, very important. You know, I think having a support system that you can run to and discuss challenges uh, and, and help you brainstorm and navigate some of these challenges is key. Having a sponsor is even better because that person really unlocks and advocates for you when you are not even there. And then finally, just making sure that you spend your time with the right people. You know, I, I like today, listening to these stories, I've got two pages worth of notes. I'm gonna go back and see what I can implement very quickly. So that's in a nutshell my experience in Tato. I hope uh, it's, it's useful for, for the audience. Matthew, I think there's some take-homes from, from you, and, and we take some of these things for granted. So one of the things you speak about is managing the minefield of exclusion, coming from a township, not speaking English, the accent. I mean, we take these things for granted, but even an accent can mean the difference between being mentored and sponsored, being seen, I mean, be just being visible, let alone being mentored and sponsored in an organization, because... We, you know, young people are still judged by their accent and not really on the, the, you know, the substance they bring to the table. And, I mean, you, you, you make it lighthearted, but it's, it's a real point to be made that um, so many odds can be stacked against you. I remember that when the NDP came out, one of the most horrifying storylines was if you were born in this particular place at this particular time, this particular race, in this particular gender, then, you know, it's game over for you, Right. <laughs> but considering that you would have been considered one of those game over guys, <laughs> you know, um, just if you could comment a little bit about how you've navigated that minefield. I mean, you spoke about the importance of learning to lead from behind and not from a position of authority, inherently based on not walking into the environment with all the accoutrements. Mm. Like my English was, you're always teasing me about my English. She calls it my good English. So, so. So what are the ways you've managed that minefield? Because I, I think there are people on the line and people who will be watching this on YouTube who are faced with a range of, of, of factors around their identity, where they come from, that they see as exclusions and that they, they see as knocking themselves them out mm. of the game. Mm. Look, Ntato, I'll, I'll, I'll share, I mean, again, my outlook and my views. I'm, again, not sure if it will work for everybody, but another big a very valuable comment and lesson that I've learned 
is that entrepreneurial mindset. You know, um, doors will not always open when you knock. Uh, but it's about realizing that I must keep knocking and a door will open, one. Two is also being able to adapt and pivot like we were talking about. I mean, you can't keep knocking the same way and the door's not opening and you keep knocking, right? Surely there's a couple of things you need to uh, adapt and, and tailor to make sure that the door opens. And then I think, again, linked to the entrepreneurial mindset, every, I, I believe that every experience offers a valuable lesson, especially the, the, the bad experiences, you know? And, and I think sometimes we are very quick to brush off bad experiences and, and not just reflect and sit down and say, what can I take away from this experience and how can I avoid it going forward? And, and that's one of the things that I've tried to instill in, in the way I do things. I try and learn from every experience because I mean, the world is changing so rapidly. You, you, you cannot remain stagnant and so fixed in your mindset that you, 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 know, you, you lose sight of, of how the world around you is changing. I'm, I'm thinking to myself, I must go and make sure that I'm ahead of Mita in terms of hydrogen now, uh, because Mita <laughs> is talking that? about hydrogen. <laughs> but but as, as an example, you know, the, the world is full of opportunities, and I think we are in a, a wonderful era Honestly, despite the COVID, despite the unemployment and all of these things, but access to information is on another level right now. Um, I think the fact that the technology is evolving at such a rate that it is today means that young people can now also start to play a role in, in these technologies because the barriers associated with experience and, and all of these things are, are removed. It's, it's almost fair play for everybody. So. I think there's opportunities abound. It's, it's how you look at the world and, and what, you, I mean, it's that half glass, half full, half empty mentality, I think for me is, is, is what is key to navigating some of these challenges in life in general. I'm going to pick up on one more theme and then we're going to go to the questions. We've got quite a few questions coming in from the people online uh, through the different channels. Um, you, you raise a point that I think is a very difficult point that many of us have to navigate, but we don't really talk about. And it's the importance of stepping back, going back. There's always this perception that you're on an upward, constant upward trajectory, and that if you slip and fall and backslide, <laughs> then it's game over. But I think it's come up a few times in this conversation about the importance of you know, going back to where you slipped or being able to move laterally. I mean, it translates in many ways. Uh, I find, you know, young people sometimes who I talk to, their professional career aspirations is every two years they're going to move, so they're going to be a VP within, you know, six years. Three moves and they're a VP. The notion of a lateral move, the, low, the notion of stepping backwards to, to pivot seems so out of sync with the way that a lot of, I find young people think that they just have to be constantly on an upward trajectory. So could you just reflect a bit on this notion of either stepping back or, um, if I can say, plateauing out, right, to, 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 to deepen and, and, and thicken, if I can say, because essentially in your experiences, the times you've gone back or you've moved laterally have been where you've broadened mm -hmm. rather than, you know, Pit, mm -hmm. rather than just you know, escalate it or continue to move upwards. And I want to raise this because I do think that this is part of what causes so much mental health problems amongst young people. This idea that if you're not constantly exceeding and excelling and growing and on an upward tra trajectory, you're a failure. Yeah. Sure. Um, I don't know if this is personal to me as well. I mean, one, again, uh, I think your, your experiences with failure and how you deal with failure teach you, you know, and I think perhaps I was lucky to have dealt with failure the way I did. So I always resort to that experience and I say to myself, how did I overcome and what of that can I use to overcome? That's, that's one. Two, I think the fact that, I mean, nothing in my life was easy, you know, nothing in my life has been easy. So it's, it's almost like I've accepted that you, you, you have to make it happen. You know, you, you have to take ownership for what happens to you 
and you are in control of the choices you make and the response that that you take to an experience. Um, I mean, after trying certain things or also growing up in an environment, especially going into Model C, where there's so many privileged people around you and you ask yourself, but why, why am I different? You, you learn to say, you know what, let me run my race. Mm. You know, I've got my own purpose, I've got my own race that I'm running and I'll get there at my own time. So, I mean, at the time when I went back to university, my friends were buying cars and moving into their own places. I was going back, like you are describing. I had to let go of my 5,000 rand a month salary at a call center, you know, to go back home yeah. and, and write taxis to work every day, uh, sorry, to, to university every day. That, that was a backward movement, but I realized that it's, it's, it's a short-term sacrifice for a longer-term gain. And, and that's how I sold it to myself. And I made that commitment, like we said, to make sure that I, I see it through at the end of the day. And it's paid off. And perhaps, again, it helps validate uh, some of my, my, my beliefs and assumptions about life. And that's what I always go back to. Maybe finally, a, a very important thing. You mentioned mental health that I perhaps did not mention and declare. Um, I was fortunate enough to have medical aid at the time when I was in university, my mom being a teacher. Um, but when I left university, there was, I did go for, 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 I went to see a psychologist because I got depressed. Um, and I was like, things are not working out, you know. And I think he also helped me navigate and asked me, but why are things not working out? What did you expect? Why do you, do you believe you deserve it? You know, and what are you going to do about it? And he pushed back on me. And I think it helped me also reflect on you know, am I being a victim or can I do something about the situation? So perhaps that's another important, important point. And psychology is not necessarily, I mean, maybe take this advice with a bit of salt. But also talking to people that have walked the journey is useful to learn from. You know, it, it doesn't necessarily have to come from a professional doctor, but somebody as a mentor that you can go to and say, I'm having difficulty with this life experience. How did you get over it and what can I learn from that? Thank you, Matthew. I think uh, there's so many themes coming out from all three of you, and including courageousness and ethics. You know, I get an underlying sense of ethics and ethos here. This, uh, you know, not this idea that whichever way the wind blows, you know, you're blowing. Each and every one of you speaks about a particular ethic or value system that drives you. Um, Mita, you, you are unapologetic about you know, being ambitious and, and wanting to be a global first and, and, you know, seeing yourself in a position of leadership in this industry. Um, Ritu Melo, you, you speak passionately about um, being able to open up and bring awareness to the opportunities for young people in this industry. Um, Matthew, you, you're unapologetic about being a public servant. There's some people who will hide <laughs> their badges and their personal numbers, so no one can see that actually they're civil servants, but you're unapologetic about it. You know, you, you, you speak about having had the opportunity through the fiscus to get here and wanting to contribute back through the fiscus. So that value system, I, I see, is such an important theme in a time where, you know, values are up for grabs, because like, that's the flip side of having such a, a connected and digital world, right? Values are, are up for grabs. Um, everything is at an accelerated race, uh, rate and influencers and more influential people set the tone. But all of you also speak about running your own race and being defined on your own personal terms and not being defined by external perceptions or external expectations. And I think that's such a powerful point to be made, I think, for all of us young people who um, constantly, I'm sure, have to fight an, a constant battle to be self-defined and not be defined by others, other things, other people, other people's experiences. Um, it, it's just be firmly rooted in your own sense of self and your own agency. There's a lot of questions coming in from the line, and uh, I hope you're ready for them. <laughs> no, the ones that have no... No person they're directed to, I'll direct to you, Matthew. 
So we have a comment here to Witumelo from Mahoka Malose. It says, do you think that the current South African youth struggles or hardships are not hard enough to stimulate the spirit of entrepreneurship, especially in the energy space? Well, that's a very good question. Um, when you compare the two generations, if I can put it that way, there's a lot we can learn from the youth of 1976. The resilience, uh, not accepting the status quo. And when we're moving back now into the youth of 2021, we more or less end up complaining or talking about how, you know, the systematic barriers are a challenge for us, you know. Things have always been done this way. Um, like uh, Matthew had mentioned in terms of getting into the plant, we certain uh, generation have always done certain things this way. And you coming in, you just need to adapt. You know, so when we come into the energy space right now is looking at to say, are we going to adapt or are we going to be resilient? Are we going to say we're not accepting the status quo, just like the youth of 1976, and say we will strategically, and like Meta had mentioned, you know, be activists and uh, pivot and, and find a way to change. If it means changing policies, let's go and change policies and um, learn from that youth uh, as well to say we are, our, we, we are responsible for where we're going and the changes that we need to make. Moloko Tupana, this is for you, Mita. I think it's taking you up on your offer. I'm a member of BIPA already. How does one become a volunteer? Um, or fully participate? Shadowing Mita <laughs> would be ideal for my exposure to the industry and learning more. Uh, no, thank you very much for being a, a member and taking on the challenge of being an activist. Uh, you can email on uh, info at bepa.org.za. Uh, full time, we answer actually 24 hours. And uh, I'll just take your name, just mention the fact that we were on this, and I'll take you on on shadowing me and, uh, and participating in the programs that we have at BEPA and also at uh, Mataku as well. Okay, I think you've just uh, pivoted, Moloko. <laughs> um, there's a point here from Notando Masike. No questions on my side, but just a comment to say that these sessions are so inspiring, especially for young people like me who are navigating their careers and who want to grow in the oil and gas industry. So that's just a shared comment to Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> and it involves load shedding. <laughs> <laughs> we have load shedding during the difficult, difficult times of the year, which is winter. Why is this not enough to drive the youth to come with alternative sources of energy and leave government or ESCOM alone? It's, it's a beautiful question. It's a, it's a beautiful question. And I'm not sure as an ESCOM employee if, if I'm uh, the correct person to answer it because it sounds like it's a general question to the youth. But on a serious note, and, and I think I want to link it to the previous question around uh, struggle, um, if I understood the question correctly. I mean, the youth of 76 had their struggle, which was very clear and which they managed to win. What I think we should ask ourselves as the youth of uh, 2020 is what is our struggle and what are we going to leave as a legacy, you know? Be it solutions to load shedding, be it solutions to poverty and inequality, be it economic uh, liberation. I mean, I think we need a cause. And, and perhaps finally, I think one thing that, that perhaps pains me about my peers and our generation, let me put it that way, and also be part of and take responsibility for part of the problem is that we are always looking for this leadership that exists somewhere, you know. And I think what we don't realize is that, and this is my view, leadership is a state of mind. You know, it's not a position. It's not, no one gets anointed as a leader. You decide in your mind that I'm going to take charge. I'm going to lead. And I think what we need is to be more active in leading the change that we want to see as, as the youth. I think this echoes something my father always says to me. When I, I always criticize him and when I see shenanigans happening, I'm like, you know, your people, your comrades. Mm. And he says to me, no, no, I've done my bit. Where are you picking up the baton? Mm. 
And I think that's such an important point to be making because there's an assumption that there's going to be a clean handover mm. and that, you know, somebody's going to walk up to you and say, here you go, I'm finished. Mm. And, it, and sometimes you actually have to pick it up from the floor. <laughs> In others, if you're lucky, you know, there might be a transition. But mm. the, the point is that each generation must run its race. As Franz Fanon always says, that each generation must, must find its cause and betray it effectively. Mm. And no one is going to... No one's going to create that space for us. It's ours for the taking. Um, to all the panel members, do you think young people of today are angry enough to effect entrepreneurial change like the 76 youth era affected political change? You know, I had one time, uh, I had an opportunity of having a talk with our current president, uh, uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa. And one of his parting shots was to say, they've done their part. We are not agitated enough. And we always keep on saying, government this, government this, government that, right? But then we are not agitated enough. Mm. And, uh, and a bad example, I don't know whether it's bad, you look at what Afri Forum is doing, right, in terms of for their own. When the, when the situation is not to their liking, the communities all pitch in. They act. 10 rand, 20 rand, 30 rands. I remember the other day, the BMF created a fund for the legal. Some of us put in our money, but then they could not get anywhere to support the BMF in terms of taking certain legal challenges. For example, we're looking at now the black empowerment policies being challenged. And where is the black voice in terms of all these black empowerment policies that are being challenged? Obviously, they were not perfect, but then should they be removed? Because our constitution actually made it a point in terms of equality, uh, we, which you must look at from a subjective manner, whereby we need to redress the imbalances of the, uh, of the past and whereby policies need to be made. But then now as the youth of today, where are we and as we stand when policies are being made for us and we are not taking part in terms of, I mean, it's a challenge and that's why I'm taking on the young person. As BEPA, we struggle to get people who actually want to be in the energy industry. But then we struggle to get people to participate mm. in our forums. We struggle to get people to comment. I mean, there was the, there's now the round four, renewable energy round four, uh, round five, sorry. We put out comments to our African people, our black people. We even went to the IPP office and said, maybe some of them cannot afford to buy. Can we even get a summary so that we can even literally spoon feed them? so that we can comment in terms of what is wrong in that uh, RFP. But we did not get comments. And then we are not going to com complain when the bids are won and they were not to our liking or we are not able to bid. Uh, and, and I always say, let's, let's be, like you say, let's be the change that we want to see. Let's be agitated enough to actually be part of the solution. You said a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, for me, just to say, I, I am a member of BEPA. I've joined since inception. <laughs> and, uh, you know, some of these uh, working groups that you, you, you've had in, in the beginning, I've, I've tried to be part of and also comment on, on the, I think it was the upstream development bill draft, that the, the first one that came out. You know, I was like, okay, working together as a group, you know, uh, and not working as individuals, you get more out of it. You know, so I liked what Pepe is, is, is done and what it's currently still doing. You know, because me as Bidumelo was trying to say I don't agree with the uh, upstream uh, development bill it doesn't carry weight. I'm like a drop in the ocean. Mm -hmm. You know, so when you're looking at what we are doing, again, you know, I agree with you, we're not agitated enough. We, we, we unfortunately complain a lot on Twitter. 
Armchair Unfortunately, activism. we complain Armchair a lot. Activism. <laughs> we complain a lot, and we are not getting together to come and find solutions, and you know, and say what can we do to change this. And that's one thing that I I think we need to go back as the youth of of, of South Africa, you know, in 2021 to say, what are we, what am I doing to contribute towards you know, the, the coming generation towards my kids to say, if I'm struggling now to get into the energy industry, what am I doing to make sure that, you know, especially being women, I mean, I think we make one person globally, right? How am I contributing to, 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 to that to ensure that my daughters are not coming in 20 years from now singing the same song, you know? So it's really about coming back, taking that step back and saying, what are you doing to contribute to the change that you need to see? Matthew? Sure. Is there anything to add after that? Um, so mine, mine is probably very simple, um, just building on, on some of the comments that were made. I think sometimes we're waiting for this big bang, big occasion that will happen, and it's a big thing that will happen in one day, and we, we lose sight of the small incremental gains we can make just by doing the things that are in our control. And, and let me use an example, perhaps it's, it may be a little bit far-fetched for now, but the recent uh, lifting of the license requirements, I mean, is an opportunity. It's 100 megawatts lifting of the license, but it does not mean 5 megawatts does not exist two megawatts, three megawatts, right? Maybe linked to the previous question about what is the youth doing about, about, about load shedding? I mean, what, what stops a certain group of people or a small number of people of saying, how do we put something together that is credible, that is defendable, using the networks that we have to contribute to the solution? You know, I think the opportunities are there, but it requires work, it requires commitment, it requires sweat. And, and I think... Mita is probably more qualified to speak about this than me, but entrepreneurs will tell you that that as an entrepreneur you work 24 hours. You know, there's no, it's not a nine to five job. It requires effort, and and I think sometimes we think things happen easily. So, I think there's a lot that can be done. We just need to roll up our sleeves and get it done. It's one of the pink elephants in the room about are we agitated enough? I think one of the unintended consequences of our parents' generation and our grandparents' generation politically transforming the country is that we have now been exposed to a standard of living and, and, and quality of life that they were not. And the, and the implication of that is they had nothing to lose hmm. when they are agitated. <laughs> we have everything to lose, some might say. Everything to lose when we are agitated. And, and so it's a, it's a different part of this generation's challenges, we, you know, we, we're not fighting for bread and butter issues. It's now the, the second level, the third level mm. of, of the depth and the granularity in, in economic empowerment, emancipation, whatever it is. So if, if, if the idea of not being able to sit on Netflix <laughs> <laughs> all night because you have to be out in the streets somewhere, it's just, you know, is, is more you know, is more uncomfortable than just being an armchair activist on Twitter, then that is the fundamental crisis we need to resolve as a generation, right? That we, we are comfortable. And we've got things that our parents never had, and therefore we've got things to lose from being, for being, from being activists and from being organized, because it can't be done if you're not organized, if you don't do it at scale. And, and I like the point that is being made here, that in our absence, it will be defined for us. Everybody else will set the tone, they'll set the framework, they'll set the policies, and, and, and we won't be able to complain. We must just comply and, and live with what gets determined for us. Yet, this is arguably one of the most educated generations, one of the most networked generations, one of the generations with the most access with the networks. So what's our problem? Um, to me. Do you think we can make the change without participating in politics? This is a great segue from my speech. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, uh, 
No, because you need to understand politics to be able to know how to navigate, right? You need to understand how the policies of 1980s or even, you know, the 1800s were set up, you know, and how that changed throughout the years for you to be able to come in and make those changes. So, unfortunately, I'm one of those people as well. I hated politics until I got to understand how politics and understanding politics plays a role in how we do things. It's not the big corporates. It's not corporate South Africa that decides X, Y, and Z. You know, it's, 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 it's politics. It's, everything is driven by politics. So once you are aware of the political landscape, you are able not to step on other people's toes, number one. You are able to navigate uh, well, you know, be very street smart. You know, know where to go, which hat to put on when you need to put that hat on, you know, for, for you to be able to have that influence in the change that you want to make. Okay, so we've got a, a lot of, quite a few um, uh, comments here that are really just affirmations, you know, the shout outs, love this, breath of fresh air, inspired. Um, and then there's others. So um, Michael Malobi speaks to, I think this is a generic question or comment. I'm not sure if we'll be able to answer it, but I'll, I'll share it. It says, are there programs to indoctrinate? Okay, that's a very strong word. Are there programs to indoctrinate the future female leaders in the energy field? This is a niche market, and as a result, it's one of the most misunderstood, uncommon fields. I would say, because she posted in terms of what indoctrination means, can maybe she define it in terms of how would she like to be indoctrinated into the energy space? And she, can she also pose it to us as BEPA so that it can be a program that she leads? I think... Uh do you want to respond to that? Um, I think, you know, within this space, I know in, in general in, on the African continent, we have certain networks that are women-specific, you know, um, women in energy, where, you know, with those programs, they try to build and develop energy leaders, female energy leaders. So it's, it's really about putting those programs in place and there are programs um, globally and I think it's also just a matter of now going to certain uh, countries and saying can we have this um, program in our own country you know leverage on the skills that you already have as leaders because you've been doing this for longer than we have right um, and I know there are a lot of mentorship programs as well um, in, in Europe where they're focusing into South Africa uh, in developing the leaders uh, of South Africa you know the women energy leaders uh, to be able to lead the space and to understand what it means to be a leader in, in, in the energy industry. In my view, I think that the Women in Energy uh, platform, your P, Empowerworks Women in Energy platform, is one of those spaces that onboards women into the energy sector. And I think this is why Ndato Maurice and uh, Priscilla decided to structure this and make sure that we do have a platform where we can break down some of the myths about the energy sector where we can give exposure to people around the different opportunities, the different dimensions, leaders within the energy sector. Um, and I think that, if anything, we need more spaces where we can gain access to information, gain access to the experiences of others, and expand our, our, net, our networks. And one of the things about women in energy that I, I do like is, you know, in my past life, I would have called myself a a feminist, but now I'm a womanist, but <laughs> is that it understands that the importance of leveraging off the experiences of men to also help onboard and share and, and, and help guide women who are moving into positions of leadership because arguably anybody and everybody on this line is a future woman leader. And this is just one of the many platforms that exists to, to share experiences and knowledge and to broaden um, our understanding of the sector and actually close that information asymmetry that so many of us have. Um, there's a point here by Soraya Thomas. I also think it's important to educate the youth that there are many careers in the ed energy sector. It's not only engineers. Many careers are represented within energy and we, all, and we need all of these careers. 
I think that's a, a good point to make. But so, for example, I'm in the energy sector. I'm a trained architect, city planner, and urban designer, but I'm here. <laughs> and I think what we've heard from everyone in the room is actually where you start and where you end could be completely different things. So it's more about the skills and the, tra the transferable skills that you gain and how you are able to apply them in, in the energy sector. I think the energy sector is such a creative space. You know, the other day I came across the, a young man the first young black South African male who had designed an electric car, uh, electric 4x4. And he started off, I think, doing industrial design or marketing or something at, at Rao, it was called at the time. But he's just applied his skills to solving a problem he felt needed to be solved for South Africa. So I, I think the, the energy sector is open to anybody and, and everybody who wants to contribute to it. Just to add, you know, whether you're a chef, you know, we need people to cook for us when we're in remote areas, you know, so you can still be part of the, of, of yeah. the sector. So really, I, I like that point that it's not only engineering, it's not only a science qualification, you can be an HR graduate, uh, you can be an auditor, it can be anything in essence, as long as you're providing a service. And it's actually, uh, energy is philosophy, right? Mm. Uh, and, yes. I, and actually a lot of the graduate schools, mm. when they're teaching about energy is actually now packaged under the, the arts degree from a, a, a philosophical perspective in terms of how you want to interpret it. I mean, we had an opportunity of working in the nuclear space as well, where we're part of the team that was writing the nuclear RFP. One of the key things that I, I actually learned from that work was that how much nuclearing, the, actually 30, only 30%, of the, of the nuclear cost, everything actually related to what they call nuclear island, the core engineering, everything else. Everything else in that program uh, was for everybody, from building the fence, like we're saying, the fence, the catering, the security. Uh, you know, there are some people who just specialize in communications and strategy around the energy space as well. It's actually, and that's why we also, if you look at our, in BEPA, our working groups, we actually cut across all throughout the value chain because it's one of the things that we actually wanted to actually expose people that you do not... Obviously, engineering is very important. We want our young people to be going to study engineering, but then there's so much uh, depth within the energy space. One of the things Pindi uh, Masengani, the, the CEO of, uh, of, 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 of PASA, said that really blew my mind is she, she was speaking about the entrepreneurial opportunities in oil and gas, and, and she said, you won't believe, during COVID, Total had booked, uh, Total uh, uh, suppliers had booked about 130 days' worth of beds, Airbnbs in George. So while everybody else was worried about their jobs, the George economy was booming, right? Because people had understood how they could fit into the value chain as entrepreneurs and as businesses. And that's why it's so important to open up an understanding of this value chain because it, is so, it has so many different levels. There are so many opportunities uh, for, for entry and to participate. And in some instances, not high hurdles for entry, you know? And that's, I think, part of the responsibility of, of, of um, bringing visibility to the value chain. Now, we've got a comment here from Abafani Tifularo, uh, He's our executive director of SAPIA, <laughs> Petroleum Industry Association. He says, very good conversation right there. I would like to get panelists' view on energy transition impact in South Africa, particularly in the power and oil and gas and transport industries. That's not fair, funny. <laughs> I think he's answering his own dissertation, <laughs> but yeah. we'll go one by one. <laughs> we'll go one by one. I think, yeah, just our views, your, your views on the energy transition impact on power, oil and gas, and transport sectors. I guess one of the key things that sometimes is forgotten in terms of the energy transition conversation is the word just. I think we always must underline that, that just transaction, transition and also the difference between emerging economies and the developed economies in terms of the different uh, powers, and also looking at where do the resources lie. And when you're also looking at the key, when you're looking at the UN developmental goals, 
um, pure zero energy. But then when you're looking at clean energy, there's also poverty, housing, women empowerment, um, no, no, uh, food, uh, food security. There is all of that. So in our way to net zero, we need to take into account all the UN sustainability goals. We need to be just. We need to take into account that emerging economies are not equal to the others. And while we, in our journey every day, in finding ways, obviously, of making sure that we are entering into cleaner energy fuels, but then while we are not leaving people behind. And that's why it's very important for the emerged economies uh, in our technology de development to spend that S extra premium or everything else to make sure that uh, the job securities and everything else are, is not affected in the meantime. So uh, in our use of oil and gas and everything else, obviously we need to do everything in a sustainable way, but then there is no I wake up, I swallow a pill, and tomorrow everything is gone. It's, it takes time, and we all need to be investing uh, heavily in all the new technologies that also from a land perspective, and, and you know, another one which we don't take into account is how much land is required actually in our journey to just transition and who owns that land and the participation in all of that and the resources that are required. Thanks, Mita. Thanks. Um, I, mean, I, I like that you spoke about land, you know, um, because in, in Germany, they are running out of land, you know, and the population is growing, but then they still need to build more wind turbines. So this is something that we need to look into when we're talking about energy transition. And again, just the energy transition to say, as and when we do transition, or rather, as and when we do transform, you know, because energy is not destroyed, nor is it created. So as and when we, we, we transform in the different energy sources that we want to use and get heavily in the energy mix, we need to take that step back and say, again, the SDG 7, it speaks to um, having access to affordable, access and affordable energy. You know, I'm skipping the clean because, <laughs> you know, I think for, for, for Africa, we're coming back to say access to energy, that's affordable, right? And currently, and I, I know a lot of um, environmentalists or renewable energy people might say, no, you've just been biased. But at, at the moment, you're looking at gas, which is a bit more of a cleaner uh, fossil fuel, right? It, it is a game changer in us trying to decarbonize from, from oil. So when we're looking at the future of the oil and gas industry, the future is still there. We are looking into the hydrogen economy we can look into the gray hydrogen, you know, so we don't necessarily have to wake up tomorrow and cut down, you know, turn off the, the, the tap and say we're not producing anymore because we will be hitting ourselves on the foot. We need to steadily um, uh, prioritize uh, providing our continent with access to energy, lighting up Africa, whether that is using renewable energy, whether that is using gas, we need to get that right first. But at the same time, making sure in our, in our strategies as, as businesses, we are putting in the sustainability framework, we are putting in the energy mix and transformation and transition framework to say 20 years from now, perhaps um, the target of 2030 for us is not realistic, you know, and we have to go back and say as organizations, as a country, what is achievable and again, take those incremental progresses and build on that. Uh, because at the end of the day, we do need energy. We need everything. Yeah, yeah I, I think we must swap positions <laughs> so I can start next time. Uh, because I'm always left with the most difficult, you know. I'm left with very little scope. I have to make something out of it. So I think I agree. I mean, the, the most important point is, is that it must be just, you know. And I, I, I think, for me, it's, it provides a wonderful opportunity to, to equalize and correct some of the legacy issues that we have as a country. So I think it presents a wonderful opportunity for all of us as South Africans. Um, specific to South Africa as well, we are very fortunate that we actually are well positioned in terms of solar and wind to take advantage of these resources which are renewable. Um, it will have a negative impact on some of the 
fossil fuel type of industries, but my understanding and the analysis that I've seen says it's a net positive gain, uh, decline in some of the, let's call them older industries, and a greater gain in the new emerging industries. So, I mean, generally, I'm also a person that is always looking forward to change and an opportunity for renewal. So I think if we are able to embrace this as South Africa and think about the opportunities it presents for us to fix some of our socio-economic challenges, I think we could really benefit from taking part in such, an, in such a transition, but obviously in a responsible and pace and, and scale that the country can, can, can absorb, for lack of a better word. And I'd just like to add in terms of, I mean, the opportunities, the green jobs that are out there. And it, it gives us an opportunity for that research in terms of when you're looking at uh, the scaling up, when, where we were when PV started. It was, I mean, more, way more expensive than, than the wind. And, and you look at where the prices are now. And, for example, with the opportunity around uh, using uh, green hydrogen uh, in terms of, I mean, the, there was an analysis done on powering gas turbines with green hydrogen. I mean, it's, and we are blessed. And what, what, what uh, that actually does, does for us is that we, are, we must not only looking at just the energy, but then hydrogen gives us an opportunity to export our resources, our wind and the sun. How do we now beneficiate? Unlike before, when Africa just used to just, uh, uh, just import, and, and, but so even in this just transition, we must look at how are we also producing the panels for Africa? How are we producing the turbines, uh, the electrolyzers? How are we getting them to a cost where, like the way we, we, we have been able to do with PV, getting the cost of the electrolyzers so that uh, the cost of green hydrogen, and I've seen it, I mean, in terms of the analysis that we're doing, soon the cost of green hydro hydrogen, you need to get it to where it is so competitive that you actually no longer talking about the premiums. I think on that basis, uh, we've exhausted the questions on the line. I think we've had a very fruitful conversation. The, the, the big point that comes out for me is that it's so important to constantly reimagine ourselves, but also to reimagine our professions and how they can contribute to, to the energy future for South Africa. And that adapting and pivoting is inherent to us as young people. And we must just lean in and adapt and pivot because that's exactly what young people do. Um, at this point, I'm going to thank the panelists for all of your amazing and well thought through reflections and inputs and sharing them with the colleagues who are on the, on the lines and on the different channels. I'm going to ask now that our uh, two patrons for Women in Energy come and help wrap up this session. We've got Priscilla, who's joined us um, from home virtually. Uh, I know we are finishing a bit early today, but uh, we, we must be conscious that we do have a, 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 we have a, a curfew that starts at 10 o'clock, being at level three. We must give everybody an opportunity to get home. So with that, Priscilla, I'm going to hand over to you. Um, thanks, thanks Tatra. Can you all hear me? We can hear you. Oh, that's, that's lovely. lovely. Um, um, good, good evening, evening everyone. everyone. And again, I apologize to our panelists that, that I've been, been joining in person. And uh, it's really inspiring to meet such young, talented individuals. And I feel quite um, inspired myself. I always say that my learning continues. And I learn upward and downward. But at this stage, it's also now looking at you as our upward leaders. And thanks for that thought-provoking session. Um, just a few recognitions before I share some few thoughts. I think first of all, is always my deepest appreciation to Dr. Morris and um, uh, for and his family for always being there to support us. Um, my Joyce is really gracious all the time to be able to accommodate us in ERP. And I'm going to miss the fantastic food tonight, but I have no doubt that you'll all be fat and uh, just have uh, one glass of wine on my behalf with Tata. The second element of recognition again goes to the ULP uh, team. Uh, it's quite a dynamic, young, talented team that continues to challenge the status quo, stealing words from our panelists tonight. 
and just to share and invest their personal time. I know it takes a lot of courage and your personal sacrifices to be able to make the sessions more successful. So for that, I want to recognize you always. In Tato, you're always doing exceptional work and uh, you're challenging thoughts and leadership. It's really exciting. So a few words from my side. I think we're meeting at the time when the world, um, particularly South Africa as such, as we see the vaccine being rolled out in a number of countries. Um, we are now going through our third wave. Is this the most challenging part? Um, I think we are probably just over 140, 150 days or so of lockdown. This COVID uh, crisis has come with a lot of challenges. It has impacted us in the most insurmountable way in terms of our families, in terms of our colleagues, our friends. And as we struggle and have our opportunities to support each other, I think at the same time, we need to recognize that as the youth, particularly during the month of, of, of June, the youth at the global level has always been the light and the hope of the world. So we should use this month not to necessarily just focus on the darkness that we are going through, but to really think harder about what are the opportunities that we can unlock? What do we need to do to challenge the status quo as it was challenged today? It's very saddening and challenging and very discouraging at times to start seeing the statistics that we're talking about in terms of youth unemployment. At this very same time, we don't recognize the need for us to pivot the skills of the country, to take advantage of the opportunities that the energy transition is going to create going forward. So as the youth on the line and non-youth on the line, such as my friend Fanny, I think the challenge for us as South Africans is in the midst of all of these opportunities, how do we position ourselves to be competitive? A number of our panelists today have spoken about the opportunities in the energy landscape. We've spoken about the just transition and how do we then ensure that we can play a critical role as a, as a youth? How do we upskill and reskill, because it's equally important, uh, to ensure that we are relevant into the future? We develop the right capabilities in the future. But part of that is not necessarily focusing on our own growth, on our own achievements, but thinking beyond that. So I'm hoping that those of you on the line and our panelists as well, that you use this opportunity to think slightly different in terms of how can we work together as UOP to broaden those opportunities, to develop the future talent, to ensure that we can actually create a space where the opportunities, entrepreneurial or professional opportunities in the energy sector, and the entire ecosystem, because the challenging part or the exciting part of the just transition is that it's creating new industries. We have an opportunity to look at components building, whether it's for renewables, whether it's for fuel cells technology, how we can build new industries, new entrepreneurs, how do we create that platform? And I do believe in the demoris that the ULP create an opportunity for us to share that ecosystem opportunities to have this dialogue and bring the likes of Mita to say, how have you achieved it? What are those hurdles like you've shared with us today that you had to go through to be able to pivot and make a difference in a highly challenging world, which is male dominated, but most important, even difficult for black people. So I look forward to the future dialogues and particularly to our August session, where perhaps an opportunity for us is to go further on what we've built today to say, how do we bring more of the youth and more of these entrepreneurs who have really disrupted what we thought was impossible and made it possible? So with that, I'm going to leave you with a few words and starting first perhaps by quoting Martin Luther King Jr. who said, if I cannot do great things, I can do small things in a great way. And I think as youth of South Africa, your challenge All right, thank you very much. We thank Priscilla. Uh, I think we need to give her. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Priscilla. Uh, I knew when I hand over this baton of uh, women empowerment, empower women to you, you'll do a better job than me. Let's give her a round of applause. She's, uh, she's amazing. She's amazing. And uh, I've never stopped speaking about her everywhere where I speak. And uh, she took over my job also at Sassol, and she's doing better than me. So, who, you know, I, I, somebody tells me women do not know how to do the job. Yeah, it's, it's, I'm sorry to use the word, but that's rubbish. Uh, it's, it's nonsense. Uh, 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 they can do better. Even, even, in fact, I think if the world is run by women, we're not going to have these wars uh, that is going on right now. And, uh, because who suffers the most when there's a war is women and children. And uh, so, thank you very much, Priscilla. Uh, speedy recovery uh, and your family. Uh, we, 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 we want you back uh, uh, to, to execute again. Tat, you always give me trouble. You and I have got some running battles. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing a good job, man. Let's give you a round of applause. <laughs> I've never forgotten meeting you somewhere in, in Europe, you know. Uh, so you're traveling, and uh, but you've left the oil and gas industry, and you've gone into the electricity. Uh, you caused this day, uh, load shedding. <laughs> but I'm sure, you know, with you and Andre and Matthew, you're going to turn it around. You're going to turn it around. I, I have no doubt in my mind uh, that uh, uh, the challenges we're facing, we as South Africans, we, uh, we, we, we solved problems. Uh, I'm, I'm part of the 1976 uh, youth. Uh, we faced the challenge that we, we tackled, and, uh, and I'm, I'm definitely sure that you are the next generation that must make a difference. Uh, Mita, I'm really excited to, 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 to know about the Energy Professional Association. Uh, when we started uh, many years ago, uh, 2000, uh, we started African Mineral and Energy Forum, which was a new entrance of small businesses. And the first law that we had to change uh, in the energy sector, now actually when I travel around the world, I see all sorts of service stations, brand, and all names. And, uh, and, I, I, and some people don't know that uh, when we started, there was a law which was called Red Plan, and it was only allowing multinationals to build service stations. So it was a huge barrier to entry for any entrance in the uh, industry. So just like what you've said, we actually studied the law, we studied the regulation, we had a minister and a DG that was pushing transformation, but we as entrepreneurs in that space had to go into that regulation, read it, understand it, and then make submissions of how it's going to change and actually word it. And we sat in those committees, drafting committees. I remember sitting with Colin, who was then the Sapir, until 1 a.m. in the morning, arguing about words, different words, uh, to change that red plan. And if you don't go down that level, politicians will shout. Everybody will shout transformation, but it's so embedded in policy and regulation. And when we changed that, we were able to build service stations as Excel, African Oil, and now we've got all these brands and new entrants. So in other words, through just that activity, we liberated the, the retail industry for new entrants. And I think that's why I encourage you, continue to force people to think, research, and come with proposals. So, well done, well done. Keep up the good work, keep up the good work. But you man, I like the entrepreneur in here. Huh? You've got an entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, you, must, you must deliver. I'm looking forward one day when I, I always say this, and I'm 95 years old, uh, I'll clap hands uh, with you and say, and I'll tell my daughters, I know that she's, that, that, but you man, and they'll say, oh, I'm cool, we are, we are big girl. <laughs> Well done, keep up the good work. Yeah. Uh, Matthew, that's great, man. Great to have a public service, uh, service. and stay clean, my boy. <laughs> Keep your nose clean. <laughs> stay clean. <laughs> I don't want to read about Yunzondo Commission. Okay. It's, 
competence and character. Those two things will take you to the top, and they'll keep you on top. Talent will, keep, will take you to the top, I say this, and, com and talent will take you to the top, and character will keep you there. And in that space where you are, there's lots of, we want public servants that are men and women of integrity, that are competent. And, and please, uh, if that's your calling, your lane stay there, because we need uh, role models there. We need uh, people who will stay in the public service uh, and, and making sure that we do all the work. So i really like to thank you. And there's nothing that excites me as ULP, that's why even you know, at my age, I should, I, should not be, I should be in my house and staying away from And I took a chance and come here. And, and uh, we, we just want to tell everybody we're sticking to all protocols. And, uh, and I've taken my jab because I'm over 60 now, so, which is great. Uh, and uh, please, uh, let's all stick to that. So in conclusion, really, I'd like to thank all this team that is working behind Nono administration and the the audiovisual team and uh, Theo, our CEO, um, for all the great work that you're doing and all the people online, keep on engaging. Uh, and I'd like to invite you, Mita, by the way. I'm now at business school and we started seven years ago, the NH Leadership Center. So please, you know, we come, come there. Come there, we're gonna start a lot of programs now. Uh, I, I've got all the CEO of the big uh, uh, companies, and the young CEOs, which I like, the four, between 40 and 50, you know, not us who are uh, old. And, you know, Mabunda, GE, Tabo, Siemens, uh, uh, who else is coming? Uh, Brian, Brian Damis is also coming. We're forming an advisory board. And I'm CEO of BP. Uh, look at them. I'm still thinking of, no, no, your shell. CEO of, of BP, they are, they are forming a, a, an advisory board to come and advise me how we take this Energy Leadership Center and make it the best in the world. So that everyone in the world, whenever they want to study energy, they come to the West Business School. So, a little bit of a pitch for business school. Huh? <laughs> All right, thank you very much. I'm huh? I'm a bit online. Oh, bit Good. <laughs> you also had you. So come, 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 I invite you uh, there. So thank you very much, all the best, and God bless you. Stay safe and stay healthy. Travel safely.